So several years ago, when I mean several years ago, I mean several years ago, I was having lunch with three other guys. And just a little background as to when I had lunch during this time, because of the people that I was surrounded with, they were people of means, people um, that when they went to lunch, a lot of times they went to lunch. It was not Taco Bell and it was not, you know, make a run for the border, you know. It was nice restaurants perhaps 80% of the time. It was a different time in my life. And at this time though, I was re just re beginning to return to God. And uh, a, a friend who was also my boss, and I've mentioned this him before, we would always go out to lunch. But at this time, we were now having a lot of theological conversations. Conversations about Jesus, the Bible, and of course, vice versa. The Bible and Jesus, and, and anyways. And we went to lunch with these other two folks that we obviously knew, good friends with uh, my boss slash friend, people that I was acquainted with very well. We're, we're, we're sitting at this table, and because it was a different time in my life, you know, Things were now different. I, have, I had had lunch with these folks many of times, particularly, obviously, my friend slash boss, but these other folks also. But now things were a little bit different, and we're there eating, nice place, nice restaurant, Italian food, one of my favorite. Am I making you hungry? You know? And a um, lot of people around there, you know, all kinds of professionals and things of that nature, downtown Miami, and my friend slash boss brings up Religious conversation. Now, I preferred not to bring it up in this context, but I remember him kind of bringing it up, and then as one of them is eating, he's kind of laughing, and they're kind of joking about our conversation, and then he says, so are you one of those born-again people? Now, throughout my whole entire Christian experience, being that I never lived in the South, but in South Florida, you all know what I mean by saying I never lived in the South. This is really the South, right? Amen? You could say, man, it's all right. You hear born again stuff here in the South, but in Miami, you know, at least I never, and in California for sure, right? So when I heard it, it kind of, are you one of them born again people? And he just kind of laughed. But the conversation kind of came back down and kind of like, you know, like he was laughing and then he wasn't laughing that, that, that much because he knew now that I was actually into this born again stuff. You know, born again. A phrase that is often used, especially here, as I just mentioned, in the South. So I ask you this afternoon, this morning still, are you born again? As we continue in the, in, the, in the teaching of John, and we go into chapter 3, it's a story that many of us know. I would venture to say, as I look out into this congregation that I hear, I don't know about those online, obviously, I can't see who's watching us, but the majority of us know or have heard a sermon, have read it one shape, form, or another, or both, throughout our Christian experience, this story of this wonderful person named Nicodemus. Now, we kind of have to get a little bit of the background in order to really put ourselves in the shoes of Nicodemus. Because oftentimes, Nicodemus sometimes gets a bad rap. You know, because he came at Jesus when? At night. You see, you guys know the story. You guys are, are, are just Bible students. And so because he came to Jesus at night, he kind of gets a bad rap. But we got to remember, you know, history tells us, one historian says, that Nicodemus was the, the third richest man in Jerusalem. How exactly they come to that conclusion, I honestly don't know. But nonetheless, he was the richest, one of the, obviously, early historians will all agree that he was definitely one of the richest men in Jerusalem. He was a Pharisee. He was a leader. As a matter of fact, he was such a leader. Do you know what his name meant? Nicodemus? What it means in the Greek? Leader of the people. How would you like to be named? Hey, what's your name? Leader of the people. My name is Pastor, Leader of the People. 
And that was his name. That was what his name meant, I should say. So he was a wealthy man. He was a leader of the people. He was extremely well-versed, to say the least. That's an understatement. As a Pharisee, he was more than well-versed in the Bible of his day, the Old Testament, right? The books of Moses. He knew it inside out. He would embarrass you guys who think you know the Bible. He would embarrass me who thinks he knows the Bible because he most likely had this Bible memorized. He knew it. He had studied it in depth. You know, to have Nicodemus as a neighbor was big stuff. I mean, if he was your neighbor, it would be like having the governor here as your neighbor. You know you'd be in a good neighborhood to be next to the governor of Mississippi. Any governor of any state, for that matter. But there's more to it, see? Many historians, not just Adventists, ha have stated that most likely Nicodemus was present when Jesus came to John the Baptist and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And John the Baptist was baptizing. That Nicodemus was present when Jesus came and overturned the tables as we studied about last week. Now think about it. Nicodemus, being the man of authority that he was, if he was there and he saw Jesus do this, as we mentioned and talked about last week, nobody did anything to Jesus for doing it. They did question him, by what authority do you do this? And you could listen to last week's sermon to get the rest of that. But if he was there, and most agree that he was there, he was an observer. It almost seemed like he was seeing something about Jesus. So with all that said, the fact that he came at night, perhaps, you know, we got to give him some credit. Yeah, he didn't come, everybody didn't see him, but at least he came to talk to Jesus because nobody else in his position came. So give the guy a little credit, church. Hmm. That's the first time you ever said amen for, Nic for Nicodemus, huh? Never got an amen for Nicodemus. Now Jesus, Nicodemus, in front of each other. And if you remember last week, we finished off by saying that Jesus didn't commit himself and trust himself to people. Do some of you guys remember that if you were here last week or if you heard online? And notice that this man of prestige and honor, you know, Let's be honest, if we were to ever come into a man, into a place where, you know, if the governor came in here today, you guys would be looking at him, you know, he would, we, we would make sure that he is seated in the right pew next to the right people so that, you know, he doesn't think that we're kind of, you know, yeah. You're following my thought process, right? That, that he's, he's, he, he makes sure that he knows where the bathroom, we treat him in a special way because he's a special guy, right? Whatever governor he is, you know, whatever party he may be from. Now, Jesus respects all that, but when, he, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus and Nicodemus get, says his, Lord, I know that you are a teacher, right? Who comes from God and so on, and my paraphrase there. Kind of buttering up Jesus a little bit. But Jesus doesn't entrust himself to him. And he tells them right off the bat, right from the beginning, he tells them, you must be born again. Wait a minute. Now, you guys know the story. You know that Nicodemus questions this aspect of being born again. When I said, talked about it with my story and I said, are you born again? I heard amens and everything. Are you sure you are born again? And Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. He, he kind of plays dumb and Nicodemus was no dumb feller. And he says, well, how can this happen? And Jesus explains to him again and essentially tells him again, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you know, you're a teacher. You should understand these things. You're a learned man. You got your PhD. You're a doctor of theology, for goodness gracious. You should know. Now, interestingly enough, one writer states the following about Nicodemus after the encounter. Nicodemus hid the truth in his heart and for three years there was little apparent what? 
Now, I don't know about you, but you would think that after an encounter with Jesus face to face, that everything would change for Nicodemus. That things would be different. That he would just be this passionate Christian following Jesus. That he would just leave all of this Pharisaic ways and follow Jesus as, a, as his strong disciple. But that did not happen. It did not happen. There was no apparent fruit. Now, it wasn't that Nicodemus was necessarily completely against what, who Jesus was. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, if you follow with me, go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And sometimes we miss this as we're reading the Bible. John chapter 7, when you're there, say amen. John chapter 7. Man, that was fast. John chapter 7, verse 45. And it says this. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? Meaning Jesus, right? The officer said, No man ever spoke like this man. Verse 47, then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? Now, what was Nicodemus? A Pharisee, right? But this crowd does not know the law is accursed. And verse 50 says, what's, what's the name there? Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them. You know, John tends to remind us constantly that Nicodemus came at night. Because there is a spiritual connotation to that. It's very important to understand that when John states this, in, in the language in which the Bible was written or the New Testament Greek, there's different aspects of time in the original language. And here, I won't get into all the specifics and not bore you, but essentially here, there is a spiritual connotation as to the reason of why Nicodemus came at night, obviously. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man because it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has risen out of, the Gal out of Galilee. In other words, it almost seemed like Nicodemus didn't come forward. But Nicodemus in the background, you know, tried to give Jesus some layaway. Let's hear what he's got to say. Because I, I kind of have heard some things. And, you know, I'm not having come out forward and given myself to him. But this encounter with Jesus apparently didn't produce much fruit. I got to ask you today, has your encounter with Jesus produced much fruit in your life? You born again people? You know, I think the narrative that sometimes we don't hit as much, I'm not saying it has never been hit, talked about, it gives us an indication perhaps why it is that at times, that we say we love Jesus and we believe in Jesus, but there isn't really that apparent fruit from that. And I believe that narrative hits that. It talks about it. Follow with me. Go to John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. Now, it is interesting to note that many theologians believe, people who have studied the Bible, right, long and hard, have noted something very important in this text that it's hard, we cannot tell from just reading itself. Now, how many of you know our wonderful text, most beloved text, John 3, 16, that we're about to read? For God so loved the world, right? How many believe that Jesus said that? Amen, Amen right? Well, the truth of the matter is that many theologians believe, interesting tidbit, that at some point in this narrative, perhaps beginning in verse 15 or 14, depending there, it's hard to tell. That actually it's not Jesus speaking, but it's John who now is putting himself in the narrative of John 3. In other words, he begins with the dialogue. John is the one writing this book. Now it kind of makes sense because think about it. If Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, how would Nicodemus, who is the only one who knows and Jesus is the only one who knows, how would John have known about this encounter? That was a question. It wasn't really rhetorical. How would we have known? It's pretty simple. How would he have known? Talk to me, church. We got all afternoon. No, there's no third service. It's a simple question, simple answer. Because Nicodemus told John. 
I mean, sometimes we want to spiritualize and say, well, maybe the Holy Spirit told John about everything that happened between... No, well, that can be true. But simply stated, many believe that simply, follow me here, Nicodemus just told John at some point. And we'll see. Nonetheless, verse 16, one of the most well-known texts in all the Bible, if not the best-known text in the Bible, Say it with me, church. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have... Verse 17. You don't have to repeat it after me now, but... For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not, con is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Are you seeing a pattern of a word that's being used pretty consistently? What is that word, church? Believe. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And if you even go to the end of the chapter, I won't go with all those texts at this moment, but verse 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life and he who does not what? Believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Pretty straightforward. No apparent fruit. What is the reason? Well, let's talk a little bit about this very important word that seems to be stated quite a bit of times here in chapter 3 and really in the Gospel of John. And that word is belief. Now, I've stated this here before, and I know I have because I follow and know what I preach. But the word belief and faith, though we use two words in the English language, in the Greek, it's the same word. It's just from the same root word. John Pauline, one of the foremost theologians of the writings of John, says faith, or belief, I added that in, in there, is always a verb in the Gospel of John. Faith as a verb is not static. It is not a one-time thing. It is ongoing and continuous and action required. When you have faith in something, you have faith towards what? On something. I have faith in a person. I have faith even in an object. Right? And faith is active. Particularly in the book of John, it is a verb. Now Paul uses it as a noun. So you have the word faith as opposed to believe. Little teaching there. Our group, our small group, is reading this book called Not a Fan. It's written by Kyle Eidelman. I highly recommend it. And uh, those that are in our small group, they'll, they'll, uh, they've heard this because we studied this this week. Now, the book is about being a committed follower of Jesus and not just a fan. Hence the title of the book, Not a Fan. Buy the book and you'll uh, understand our small group thus far has really enjoyed it. But in the chapter that we covered this past week, he talks about this issue of belief. And he said something that, that just really simple, but really made me think. So I brought the book, and I want to read it to you. When I was studying about the word belief, I came across a secular article written by a psychiatrist. In the article, he addressed the beliefs of his patients that had no basis in reality. Now, follow me here. A patient may sincerely believe he can fly. Anybody here believes they can fly? Thank God. A patient may sincerely believe he can fly, but that didn't mean anything because there was nothing to back that up. The patient may be an abusive husband that sincerely believes abuse is wrong, but he doesn't really believe that because his stated belief is contradicted by what? Reality. But when the psychiatrist was speaking with his patients about his patients with beliefs that had no basis in reality, he didn't call them beliefs. Do you know what he called them? He called them delusions. 
We don't often think of it this way, but there's an important truth that needs some attention in circles of faith. A belief, no matter how sincere, if not reflected in reality as a belief, is a delusion. He further goes, or beforehand, he gives this simple illustration. Okay, it's not mine, it's his, and I'm borrowing it from him. It's one that we can associate because we just had a little health thing going on a couple of weeks ago, right? And he says, if I were to take a survey of the American public, right, of America, and I were to ask in the survey, do you believe that it is important to eat healthy and exercise? The grand majority of people would say, I believe. But the reality is, and the statistics prove this, not, not, not done by an Adventist, okay? Statistics prove that that belief is to many really a delusion because the grand majority of people are overweight, obese, don't take care of themselves, don't exercise, blah, 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 you understand. That, that's not the point of the sermon. The point is in this aspect of belief. If belief does not really exist in reality, it's a delusion, according to Kyle Eidelman. So now if I were to ask you, <laughs> are you born again? Do you really believe what you say you believe in? And how is that expressed in the reality of your life? You see, when we talk about that aspect, about the truth, about believing, what does that mean? Truth is, is, is what? In essence, the Bible truth is a person. Somebody say amen. But when we say that we believe in Jesus, what are you saying? When you say, I'm a born again Christian, what are you saying? How does that express yourself in reality? Nicodemus knew a whole lot about many things in the Bible, as we stated, more than any of us. When it came to understanding law, he was flawless. But listen to what this writer states. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. The reality is this is the only way that we can change. We can say a lot that we believe that we're good Christians and all this kind of stuff, but your life, my life, will essentially detail, give the real details, the reality. The text in the Bible, the text in the Bible that in this narrative says that one of the reasons people don't come really is essentially that. Because when we come to the light of Jesus, Jesus exposes us for good or for bad. It just happens. It's not that Jesus has come to condemn us. Jesus has come and came to save us. But when the light comes and man is in darkness, he doesn't want to be what? Exposed. If you remember the story of Peter that we've preached about here, when he is on the boat and the big miracle of fish takes, happens, right? Peter says, get away from me for I am a what? An un a, a sinful man. Nicodemus approaches Jesus. And let me tell you, I believe, this is my belief. It's not that it's in the Bible. I believe that Jesus or Nicodemus saw Jesus and even Nicodemus was feeling uncomfortable. Because he's next to the light of the world. And when you're next to the light of the world, everything is exposed. You can't hide before God. Right? The old saying, you could run, but you can't hide. And everything is exposed. Now, we sometimes think of this as like, well, that kind of seems kind of gloomy, kind of, you know, harsh. But I believe it's a blessing. It begins to understand. It begins to challenge us at our heart. When we say that we believe in Jesus, well, Jesus believed in love. By this, all men will know that we are your disciples if we love one another. Well, can we really say that? The fruits of the spirits. Right? What about our anger? What about my anger? My wife is here, right? Totally exposed. How do we deal with that? 
Who do we say that we are and is that reality? The truth. The biggest problem, if you look into the text that is implied, along with what we're reading here, is us. The biggest problem of why we don't see fruit sometimes in our spiritual lives is because we haven't died to self. In order to be born again, we must die again and again. We must die to us and live for Christ. So you're born again. Jesus has come and the light has shone. So if the light exposed your weak, would it really show and say, that person is definitely born again? Look at them at work. Look at them at school. Look at them at home. You know, that kind of makes me nervous. And I'm the preacher. But I do want to tell you something very important. I hope that I've brought you down to a point of despair. I hope you're scared. I hope that if you're sleeping, you feel guilty. I hope that guilt is just killing you right now. Man, this is really bad. What? Because I do want to tell you that there's hope. Until we realize our own state, we'll never want to change. But I want to tell you, though, that there is incredible hope. Because you and I are all Nicodemuses. In some shape, form, or manner, we are Nicodemus. We have all said that we have been born again. We have faced Jesus in some shape. Maybe not face to face, but we say we have encountered Jesus. We've grown up with Jesus. We've heard about Jesus. We've accepted Jesus. And throughout our journey with, you know, Jesus, we've left him. And we've walked away or we've walked. Many things have happened. And perhaps you're wondering now, well, after all that, pastor, I feel really, you fill in the blank. But I want to tell you there's hope. And I want to give you the hope. I want to give you the hope. Because this, this week, has really hit me once again. And it's through the life of Nicodemus. You see, it's been said, historically, that something happened to Nicodemus. Something happened that changed his whole way of being. That I think it really hasn't permeated, in a sense, to our church yet. We so continue to focus so much Even as I hear different people speak, not from the pulpit necessarily all the time, on all the things that we need to do to be saved, we continue to focus on the rules and regulation, and we're afraid not to focus on that because then people will go down the slippery slope, right? And so we say, if we have enough, you've heard it from me several times, and purposely I continue to remind you and and remind myself. If we just do enough, then somehow I've pleased God. But we're afraid not to say those things because if we go the other route, we're afraid then then the people won't do anything. So if I get them to do enough, then then they'll feel they're right with God. And really, that's completely unbiblical. Because something happened to Nicodemus and it obviously wasn't all the rules because he had them all. He was a master of it. He had them mastered. He was the best Seventh-day Adventist you could ever pay for as a Pharisee. But there was something that changed his life. And the one thing that changed his life was a look. It has been said historically that Jesus, that Nicodemus, when Jesus died on the cross, It hit him. You say, what did it hit? It hit the conversation that he had nearly three years before. And if you go with me to verse 14, this is what hit him. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And if that was what Jesus told him, right? Then something happened to him, and as he's looking, he's saying, this man is being crucified. I remember what he told me. Surely he is the one. 
I have read about him. I know everything that I have read about the Messiah. Jesus, it was you. And to prove to you from the Bible that Nicodemus was never the same, that he completely changed his life forever, that I guarantee you Nicodemus, no matter what service he would be in, no matter what church he went to, he would be a completely changed man because of what he saw. Follow with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, if you have your Bibles, read this with me. If you have a phone, read it in your phone. I don't care how you use it, just open up your, the Word of God in John chapter 19 and watch this now, the life of Nicodemus. We saw him in John 7. Now, watch how John mentions him again. Verse 38 says, after this, what does after this mean? The death of Christ, right? Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And who does it say there? Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night. That's kind of John saying, let me tell you one more time when Nicodemus came. Also came bringing, what did he bring? A mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pounds. None of the disciples could have done that. They were poor. What Nicodemus brought was costly, to say the least. Nicodemus had seen Jesus and everything had changed in his life. He had seen Jesus where? At the cross. He had seen this is the Savior of the world. And that compelled him to do incredible things for the rest of his life. And it's, it's proven biblically and it's proven also historically. Where it has been said that Nicodemus, a man of prestige, of money, of wealth, authority. That he lost it all for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was the one that many times funded the work of the apostles. The authority that he had as a Pharisee, he lost it because he began to follow Jesus. Now, none of us really could understand that because if you follow Jesus today, it's really the opposite here in the South. If you don't follow Jesus, you're kind of weird. If you follow Jesus, then you're all right. You know, a Baptist, Methodist, whatever it is, you're okay. If you don't follow, if you're an atheist or Wiccan, then you're really weird here. You're not weird if you follow Jesus here. Maybe in certain parts of California. So we can relate to that. But he lost all authority in his life because he saw Jesus. And money? Nobody had to tell him, make sure you give your tithe and offerings. No, he gave it all. Now look, I'm not telling you to give it all when it comes to your finances. But I am telling you that I believe we need to give it all from our heart. You see, the hope is found in looking at Jesus. The hope is in that relationship. And from that relationship stems out reality. We can focus much on what we do and what we don't do. But the reality is we do in our Christian experience based on the reality of our experience and understanding of Jesus. And when that reality is not there, the reality on the ground as what we actually do is seen one way or another. Now, we make mistakes. We're not claiming perfectionism here. My wife will tell me, go boil an egg and I will put it in place and it will blow up. <laughs> Though she's taught me a million times how to do an egg. We're not claiming perfectionism. I will sometimes, many times from here, perhaps stick my foot in my mouth. But it's how we respond to that in the light of the cross. Today, Jesus is calling you. Now, I say you because, you see, I've already been punched in the gut this week by the Spirit of God for my own life. But many of you perhaps are in unhealthy relationships. 
either marriage or, or cousins or uncles or brothers or sisters. And people look at that. The other ones in your family members that aren't Christian, they say, well, look at him. He claims to believe an ex-person named Jesus. But look at them. They've been angry for the last 10 years over spilled milk on the couch. That marriage, the whole family knows it's in shambles and nobody wants to fix it. Nobody does anything about it. And they believe in Jesus? Look at him. They got her. They got, they got money. I've asked them for help and they never help. And I really, 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 really need it. In a good way. Not, a, not helping somebody to not go work or whatever. And they claim to be Christian. I just believe more and more. And it's been a conviction this week that reconvicted me that I need to look at Jesus at the cross. You see, right there at the cross, I can't look at anybody else. As soon as I see Jesus at the cross and contemplate what Jesus has done for me, you know what happens is that flashbacks of how and what and when and where Jesus has saved me from so many things. The sins that I have overcome, the ways that I have faltered, the ways that I may falter, the things that I believe he'd want me to do, and it's all exposed because the light of Jesus is showing me And he gives me hope and he says, don't despair, Javier. Because I'm about to do something incredible in your life. You can still, and there's still time to turn that page and fully commit yourself to Jesus. Not in a delusional state, but in a state of reality. So I ask you, and I finish by asking, are you really one of those born again people? You know, I've been preaching here for three and a half years. I didn't say this in the first service. I should have. But if I die tomorrow, or after I leave here, to some extent I've died content. Because I preached this message of Jesus and the cross. Not that the other ones, or at least I tried, but of all of them, this one, today. Because I am Nicodemus. There's something very powerful here too is that sometimes we get upset at people, perhaps in our families or friends or, you know, why aren't they more, why come they're not studying more? How come they don't do this or that? And one is quickly reminded, stop. First of all, you're not God and you're not the spirit of God. But secondly, it took Nicodemus years before he finally realized Jesus knew he had laid a foundation. So maybe you have a loved one that you're wondering what, a son, a daughter, somebody who's far away. I want to tell you, continue to love them and show them Jesus yourself. Admit your faults, your mistakes, and tell them, you know what, son, daughter, uncle, aunt, I am a born-again Christian, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Young people, whoever considers themselves young, I implore you to wake up. I know this world pulls you in so many directions. Like it pulls every adult also. But I'm telling you that Jesus is coming soon. And at the end of the day, What do you have except for Jesus? And everybody here of all ages, I implore you, look at Jesus on the cross and be changed. Turn over that new leaf and say, I I want to follow Jesus all the way. I want to be a fully committed follower of Jesus. I don't care what has happened before in the past, things at church and how I didn't like it or I liked it. Listen, I've said it again. I've said it before, I said it again. Get over it. It's the whole part of being born again. 
Be done with it. Don't define yourself by what people say about you. Define yourself by what Jesus is going to say about you at the end of your day. Because nobody in here is going to stand up for me today before Jesus. Nobody. I got to stand up for myself. And you young people all the way around here, yeah, you already. And I'm not talking about 18 year olds. You, you, you young people, you will have to stand, are standing right now before God. And that's a good thing. It's not, this is not gloom and doom. That's a good thing. Everybody here, as we believe, right now is standing before the presence of God Almighty and your, your hearts are exposed before God. And the beauty of it is that God is so patient and so loving. And, and I believe through me, yes, through me, not in, in an egotistical way, He's imploring you as He implored me this week. Look at me. Look at me. And when you look at me, Javier, don't look at what others are doing or not doing or should be doing. You look at me and you go forward and you preach and you love and you go and you will see. You will see what happens. You cannot control anything else. You let me control it. Because sooner or later, those people will never be able to say they didn't hear Jesus. You didn't proclaim the cross. The opportunity was there, not only on Saturday for an hour and a half or two or whatever it may be, but every day they heard it. Hey, in today's technology, speaking of Steve Jobs, it is there. You could listen to it online. You could read your Bible on the phone. You could put up a prayer request. You can do a million things. You could be in London and still watch the sermon. You could watch sermons all the time. There's so many ways of now seeking Jesus. But we all prefer Facebook. That's for another day. I'll stop. So I don't know where you're at today. I know where I'm at. I don't know where you're at today. But if you really want to tell Jesus, Jesus, I want to be born again. Oh, I know that sounds old school. So what? If you really want to say, if you want me to say it in a different way, Lord, I want to be fully committed and see you at the cross because that's where you can be changed because we're all on equal ground. At the foot of the cross, the governor is a sinner. The president is a sinner. The preacher's a sinner. We're all sinners in need of a savior. So if that's your desire, you know, we're a smaller group here today. If you really want to, I haven't asked you to come forward in a while. I want to have a very special prayer. And I'm going to ask you to come forward. I'm going to ask you to come forward if you want to tell Jesus this morning, I believe in the one who so loved the world that gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Gracious God, we come to you this afternoon asking that you help us see you. Amen. For you said, and I, if I be lifted up, would draw all men unto me. Nicodemus was changed when he saw you crucified on that cross. I could only envision and maybe one day soon, Lord, I'll be able to even ask him, what went through your mind when you said, 
Father, forgive them. What went through his mind when you said, it is finished. There's victory in Jesus. It is finished. I can overcome. There's hope. And today there's still that hope, God. Surely in the light of the cross, you expose us for who we are. That is a good thing. But you also tell us that through that light, you empower us to be born again. And every day, Lord, I want to get up and I want to say, Lord, I surrender to you. May I not live, but you live in me. So that the life that I used to live, I live by faith, by belief in the Son of God who died for me. Who gave his life for me. For you, church. He died for your sin. He died, yes, for your anger. He died for your misdeeds he died for all of them and you are forgiven rejoice today live in power through the spirit of God who is the only who is consistently chasing after you and me right now he is being poured out upon this church right now and those that are watching online may we leave leave here born again For it is in your name that we pray. And we all conclude by saying, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sabbath.